will praise your name, I will praise your name. When times of need carry on, I will praise your name, I will praise your name. Jesus Christ shine forth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us. Welcome to another live stream with DCCI Ministries. Can I just get quick confirmation regarding sound and vision is okay? Because from my side, it doesn't look like all right, but I will, I will kind of take your word for that. And Yes, the moment I get sound confirmation, I will be telling you the plan. So far, we, you can pretend there is no plan for tonight. 
Um, yes, sound is good. Thank you very much, Brother Jai. Um, so since sound is good and vision is all good, then you've got privilege to know that on the line we do have Brother Steve with us. He's joining us from the state, correct? Yes, <clears throat> from the state of California. Peace of Christ be with you, brother. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. It's great Is California hot or cold, brother? It's raining right now. Is that hot or cold? Um, it's it's you know it's Southern California, so it's not too cold, but it's uh you know it's like about sixty degrees Fahrenheit. That's the American uh, <laughs> temperature system. So. So I think that's you, different from the metric, which is what you guys have. So, when you go out, do you need to wear coat? Yes, I do. Do you have to wear gloves? No. No. Okay, it's hot then. <laughs> it's it's hot in our criteria. Um, <laughs> how are you doing, brother? I'm doing very well, thank you. So, uh, dear beloved ones, what we are going to do tonight is, since we reached all the way to state. Um, with the brother Steve, uh, we will be kind of hearing a little bit about him, who he, who he is, and once upon a time why he left Islam and today why he is not Muslim, as well as we will be hearing a little bit about his ministry. So my uh, hope and prayer that tonight will be another evening where we are delighted in our delightful Lord as well as we get to know um, what's happening in the different part of the world, because our Lord is actively working in the life of individuals. And we will be hearing testimony where God not only kind of touches people, but he touches people and he transforms those individuals. So therefore, I just thought if anyone feels disappointed or discouraged or just doesn't know what's happening in the life, tonight will help us to know that king of kings lord of lords lord jesus christ is still on the throne he rules and reigns so that's the purpose of the evening if you end up being discouraged that means it was the problem or sin of steve not me i'm i'm doing my part from this side if you feel still discouraged then person to blame is brother steve uh, Brother, yes, I met you two weeks ago. Yes, and you humiliated me on your YouTube channel. I still remember that, and I, I don't know why you think that's funny. Uh, that's not funny, brother. I hope you did repent. If you haven't repent, I'll just gently encourage you to bring everything to the foot of cross, and Lord Jesus Christ will deal with that. Um. Brother, tell us who you are. Well, um, first of all, it's, it's an honor to be with you. I'm very blessed by your ministry. I've been inspired by your ministry about what you're doing for the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, and I really think that the Lord has used you to really encourage ministry to Muslims. And I'm so thankful for that. Um, myself, I'm, I'm 57 years old. My name is Steve, but my real name is Hussein, and uh, my father is Palestinian. Uh, he passed away a year and a half ago, and then my mother is from Brazil. This is a very common arrangement. Uh, quite often with Palestinians, they used to go to Brazil to marry Brazilian women, and then they would come to the United States, and so that's what happened, and I was born in the United States, in uh, California, and when I was born, my parents agreed that I would be raised a Muslim. Uh, you know, my mother and father talked to each other, and my mother was Catholic, you know, from Brazil. And, uh, but my father asked and said, you know, uh, so what religion will the kids be, you know? And, uh, and my mother said, uh, uh, like you, you know? So uh, anyway, we were raised Muslim, but my father, uh, he was illiterate. He, did, he never learned how to read or write. So he didn't know very much about Islam except for to go to the mosque and pray and stuff like that, you know. And uh, so we weren't really brought up as very religious Muslims. We didn't eat pork, you know, stuff like that. We didn't have Bibles. We knew that we weren't Christians. And so there, uh, you know, and that we can't go to church and stuff like that, you know. And we couldn't have Bibles and stuff. 
And uh, and so I always knew that I was there was something different about me, but I didn't really know what it was. And uh, and then, but when I was nine years old, my mom left our family, and uh, she uh, ev- en- ended up divorcing my father. When she did that, my dad took me to his village, which is in uh, the West Bank near Jerusalem. And uh, and he he married another woman and he left me there for three years with this uh, uh, in the village over there. And while I was there, uh, I was a little spoiled American kid, which I still am. But, you know, I had, uh, you know, I grew up on Speed Racer TV, you know, electric heating in the house, you know, and all this stuff. I went over there. There was no electric heating. There was no TV. There was. I mean, it's like almost stepping into the Bible uh, period, you know, it was, uh, and this was in the 70s, so 1972, and uh, and while I was there, you know, I started going to school, because I didn't speak Arabic at that time, so I had to learn how to speak, read, and write Arabic, and so I went, I was in the fourth grade in the United States, because I was uh, nine years old, but when I went back to the Holy Land, I, I went back to first grade. And that to learn because I didn't know any Arabic, so I had to learn how to read, write, and speak. And uh, and and of course, you know, in the Middle East, you're going to you have to learn Islam too. And, and our village is uh, very committed to Islam. They're it's 100% Muslim, except for a few Christians uh, who got you know they married foreign women and stuff like that. And so uh, anyway, uh, that's when I started learning Islam and. And I was so hungry to know about Jesus. I really loved Jesus. Even as a kid, I used to always ask my mom to tell me about Jesus, you know, and that, but she was kind of afraid because she had made the agreement with my dad that we would be brought up Muslim. And so she wouldn't, didn't want to, you know, shake the boat or anything like that, you know. So she wouldn't tell us about Jesus. But I really loved Jesus because I had seen like movies. There was like a movie called uh, The Robe, and there's another movie called uh, Ben Hur. And these are like, Hollywood movies, but they had the crucifixion scene in them. And so I remember watching those and thinking, wow, who is this Jesus, man? And why did he do that? Uh, you know, why did they do that to him and everything like that? And uh, and so I always wanted to know about Jesus. My mom wouldn't tell me. But um, and but one day, she she did let me bring a Bible home. Now, this is in the United States. I'm kind of back in the, I'm sorry, I jumped back to the United States real quick. This is when I was like seven years old. I brought a Bible home from the library. She said, because I was keep nagging her about Jesus. And finally, she just said, just bring a Bible home and read it. And I read the Gospel of John. And I know that's the Gospel of John because of the miracles that were in it. And I just fell in love with Jesus, man. I just loved Jesus so much, man. The way he healed people, the way he was so kind, so powerful and everything. But then I saw that, wait a minute. I, when they came to the part where they said to kill him, you know, they wanted to kill him. And I didn't understand why did they want to kill him? You know, what did he do wrong? But I, I, I mean, I understood they wanted to kill him, but I didn't, you know, nobody explained it to me. I was only seven years old and I didn't understand. And so I'm thinking, you know, why did they want to kill him? And uh, I tried to figure out something that they did, that he did wrong, maybe that they wanted to kill him, but I didn't see nothing. And so I read the book and uh, and then when it came to the crucifixion, I remember that, that they were saying, like, uh, kill the king of the Jews or something like that, you know. And I remember seeing the pictures of, the, you know, uh, his white gown with red stripes on it and stuff, blood and everything, because it had pictures in it. And uh, and I remember looking at that. And, uh, and then I read that they uh, crucified. But, you know, I was so young, I didn't know what that meant. And then I heard... That when he that they put a body in a tomb and after three days he came back to life, and 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 I remember thinking who is that that came back to life? I didn't know that it was I didn't understand that it was Jesus who came back to life or that it was him that died, and so but what I thought because I was seven years old and I was just beginning to understand death, and I thought oh this is a great story because if anybody dies just put him on a rock for three days and he'll come back to life you know. That's what I thought when I was seven years old. So anyway, you know, and as the anyway, but uh, two years later, my parents divorced and my dad took us to, you know, to the Holy Land. And 
And then I started learning about the Muslim ideas of Jesus. I asked them, who is Jesus? Tell me about Jesus. And the Muslims were very eager to tell me about Jesus, about Isa. And they told me, well, Isa is a wonderful prophet, and he's great, and he, but he's not the son of God. And you see, I didn't really know that he was the son of God. I didn't really understand that. And he didn't die on the cross. You know, a God put him, uh, God uh, made somebody else look like him, took Jesus into heaven, and, you know, they did not kill him, they did not crucify him, it was made to appear so to them. And so this is what I learned, you know. And I became, I was so spiritually hungry, I devoured what they told me. I became very, very committed, very, I, I have that religious nature. I want, I was very religious by nature. And I wanted to learn about, about God. And so I devoured everything they told me. I was 100% convinced that Islam is the last religion, Muhammad is the last prophet, the Quran is the last book, and that Christians have to become Muslims or else they're going to go to hell. And so I was completely convinced of this. And uh, um, and then, uh, you know, I just, I continued, you know, learning more and more about Islam. And, uh, you know, we used to have sheikhs who, you, who used to come to our classrooms and teach us about Laylat al-Qadr, about, you know, about, uh, you know, Ramadan and about, uh, you know, the different surahs in the Quran and stuff like that. And we, I was young, you know, I was young and my Arabic, you know, even though I did learn to speak and read and write, it was still, I was an American speaking, you know, with a bad accent and everything, and uh, which I still have in Arabic. But uh, when I was 12 years old, my mom made my dad bring us back to America. Now that when I say us, that's me, my and my sister Fatima. She's we both went through the same situation together. And we both became very devout Muslims, you know, very committed. And uh and then when I came back to the US, I was still very committed to Islam. You know, I I did not pray, I did not fast or do any of those things, you know, because I I didn't really know how to. But I was very committed in my heart. I was very, I knew there was a difference between Islam and Christianity. I hated Christianity. I okay. did not hate Jesus, but I hated Christianity. And so, so, I did, so I did express to you that you are extrovert, all these things, and you speak so fast. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a couple of practical questions for me to follow the story. Is that okay? Sure. <laughs> uh, what are you drinking? What is so funny, brother? Are you drunk? What is that? Are you getting drunk during the live stream? <laughs> <laughs> um, That's but, a Diet Coke, by the way. So, I think normal Coke is much healthier than Diet Coke. Well, I'm a diabetic, and so I'm not and allowed to have... And you shouldn't be drinking at the first place. As a Christian, one of the, your responsibilities is to look after the body Lord given to you and use it for his glory. But anyway, that will be another topic. Since you are my guest, I need to be very nice to you, even though you humiliated me the other day. Um, so, um, your father is a Muslim, your mom is Catholic. And um, in Islam, when you marry people of other faith in this occasion, um, arrangement was children will grow up as a Muslim. Therefore, in somehow, um, your mom did not share or talk to you about Jesus. That's right. Uh, did I understand that correctly? Your father married in in Middle Wait. East while he was married still in the state or? <laughs> yes, you did understand that, right? <laughs> okay, so your your father married with someone while he was already married with someone in the state. Well, he was still married to my mom. He hadn't divorced her yet, you know, but illegally. He did do the three divorces, you know, where he went to the mosque and said, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, uh, you know, to work the Islamic divorce. But he did not divorce her legally in the United States. So in the United States, he was still legally married to her. That, that to me screams out as very, very Islamic. Okay. That's not very good at all. Um, 
so in that stage you were with your father where you start learning about learning arabic and you uh, you start going to school in, yes. in one point you came to state where um you want to kind of read the bible to find about uh, find out about jesus as as you were reading the bible you are age seven or nine i think seven seven yeah and in that stage like did you not ask question to your mom regarding like oh what is crucifixion this jesus is like so nice mommy can you tell me about the story of jesus you you, you know i i didn't and it's like to tell you the truth when i was reading it i devoured it i loved i loved what i was reading i was just sitting there i remember at the corner of the sofa reading it i was eating it up it was going inside of my spirit it just was so powerful and uh I, I kind of understood that my mom didn't really want to talk about it, you know, but you know what happened is when I got done, uh, when I got done reading uh, the story, the Gospel of John, you know what I did is I took a piece of paper and I drew, I drew a crucifix. Yeah, I drew a crucifix with a cross with Jesus on it. I drew it. And I went and I showed it to my mom in the kitchen. I remember this. And I said, look, mom. And she said, your father's not going to like that. So, you know, so uh, that's what I remember. She, she never become a Muslim or she never was interested in Islam? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, you went back to... Um, Palestine where you kind of start learning Arabic you went to you went to school and uh, at the school you are gently forced to learn about um, Islam and you would identify yourself as a Muslim what you are learning but also your friends kind of made it very clear to you uh, made it very clear to you that even though you know a little bit about Jesus of the Bible Islamic Jesus is very different and Islamic Jesus is not the son of God and Islamic Jesus did not die on the cross. So that right. that is in your mind. When you went back to state, uh, when you went back to state, you are kind of, okay, my identity is Islam now. Correct? Yes. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I am following what you are saying. You speak fast for me. Uh, okay. Uh, so, you know, the way I would, I, the way, you know, like I said, I didn't pray. I didn't, I didn't fast Ramadan or do anything like that. In my heart, I was very committed to Islam. And I, in fact, I was the most religious person in my family. I mean, I was so religious. They all, they knew how committed I was to Islam. And uh, I remember one time where uh, my father had friends over and uh, they uh, and they were like drinking alcohol, you know, and uh, and I went and I took the alcohol from in front of my dad and I threw I spilled it out in the sink in front of all of his friends, you know, just because I knew that you know, the two sins that I remember as a kid about Islam is you're not supposed to drink alcohol and you're not supposed to uh, gamble. You know, that's what we were told. You know, those are like the big sins that I used to hear about, as well as eating pork and stuff. And uh, so I was I was very committed and I used to always, you know, um, I, I, I remember that I used to always take the Quran and I would I'd put it in front of me and I, and I would sit in the uh, living room and I would say, Allah. Can you do something in my life? You know, can you help me? Uh, you know, as I started getting a little bit older, and I just said, you know, Allah, can you help me? You know, can you do something in my life? And and I I started beginning to feel emptiness in my heart. You know, as I, I was getting a little bit older, you know, entering, you know, puberty and stuff, and, and I just felt this great emptiness in my heart. And I just, and I would always say, Allah, help me. Allah, do something. Allah, you know, and and, you know, nothing ever happened. And uh, so Allah, and, Allah wasn't there when you were in need of him. That's right. Okay. He didn't do nothing. And, and 
And I always used to like to watch religious movies. I was very religious, you know, I, and I, I used to like to watch. And there's a movie called Jesus of Nazareth that used to come on every year in Easter. And, uh, and I used to love to watch that movie. And uh, it made my dad mad. He didn't like that I used to watch it, you know, but it was like on for three weeks in a row. You'd watch one hour every Sunday before Easter, you know, and so uh, <laughs> I, I used to love to watch that movie. And uh, even though I know it goes against the Islamic belief about Jesus and uh, but and, and whenever I'd walk by a church because, you know, I used to walk to school, you know, because I was a teenager and I was walking to high school. Every time I'd walk by this church, they had a huge cross in front of the, of the church, and I would always spit at it, you know, when I walked by it. And I kind of felt that was my religious duty. I had to spit at this cross, you know, as I was walking by. <laughs> and uh, and then, then on when I, when I was 15 years old, I was alone in my house, and this is in California. And I, my dad used to go work on the weekends far away. He was a traveling salesman. And so I was alone in the house that night, and uh, I was watching. <laughs> Should I go ahead and continue? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So sorry. So sorry. Okay. Well, there you you got back at me for my uh, my. Uh... <laughs> no, no, no. This was this this was disrespectful. I'm so sorry. It was out of control. I'm so sorry. Um, so you got back to California. Yes, and uh, I was 15 years old. I had been in the U.S. three years by then, and uh, I was. It was the night before Easter, 1978, uh, and I was 15 years old, and I was watching. Uh, Saturday Night Live, that's a famous program here on TV in America. It's every Saturday night they have it. And uh, and so I was watching Saturday Night Live. And then after Saturday Night Live, it's one in the morning. There's nothing else on TV but an Oral Roberts crusade. Oral Roberts is a very famous event, healing evangelist in the United States. And he was having his, his Easter crusade. And uh, so uh, I better be careful using that word crusade because that always gets me in trouble. But <laughs> Crusade meaning, you know, his big ser sermon that he does on Easter. And uh, and while he was talking, I don't even remember what he was saying. He was just talking about the death of Jesus and the resurrection. And then, and then <clears throat> the Holy Spirit just fell on me. I was laying down. It was just like, boom, you know. And it was just like I was laying down, you know, and and it was Jesus was right there. I just remember, I turned my head and said, Jesus. It was just like, I, it was a miracle, man. And and when I said Jesus, it was like instantly I knew that he was the son of God. I knew he was the son of God. And I knew that he died and rose again for me. It was just instant. Bam. The Holy Spirit fell on me. Boom. And then Jesus was right there. And you know what? When he came, it was like he was an old friend that I knew before. And, you know, I believe it's from when I was seven years old and I was reading the Bible and I fell in love with him and that he was that old friend that I had met before because I knew him when he came. I knew him instantly. And uh, and so, uh, you know, I was alone in the house and I didn't have anybody to tell about what happened. It was a miracle. And, you know, the only way I've through the years I've tried to explain it. Uh, to people to describe what happened. And I think the words in the Bible are the best description where it says, it says uh, in Arabic, يقول الله في الأيام الأخيرة سأسكب من روح يا جميع البشر. In English, God says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And that's what he did. He just poured out his spirit on me. Like, <laughs> that's exactly what it felt like. And, uh, I, you know, I don't even say, you know, say that I was a Muslim and I became a Christian. I was dead and I came to life. And I wasn't dead because I was a Muslim. I was dead because Jesus wasn't in my life. And when Jesus came, he brought me to life. I mean, instantly. You know, when I, I used to put the Quran in front of me and say, Allah, help me. Allah, do something. He never did enough. But Jesus did it. 
he filled that emptiness inside of my heart. I was so miserable, so empty. Jesus filled it like he told the woman in John 4, I'll give you water. If you drink of it, you'll never thirst again. That's what happened. And it was instant. It was a miracle. It was so powerful. And it's just, you know, I didn't have anybody to tell because I was alone in the house. But, you know, I wasn't wearing a shirt, you know, because it was it was hot and stuff. And so what I did is I went into the bathroom and we had this toothpaste and it was red. It's called close up toothpaste. And so I drew a cross on my chest with a toothpaste. <laughs> That's my way of saying, hey, I'm a Christian now, you know. And it was such a miracle. And uh, and so, uh, anyway, that... Let, let me ask a practical question. What? So you express that once you turn to a um, state uh, where you identified yourself as Muslim, yet you are not practicing Islam in its form. Uh, you were spitting on the cross when you saw um, in front of the churches, what was your motivation? Why would you do something like that? You mean spitting on the cross? Yeah. Well, I, I believe that is that Christianity was a deception from Satan. You know that it was. Uh, it's been changed. The religion's been changed. The crucifixion is a lie. Jesus wasn't crucified. Jesus is not the Son of God. And I really, you know, one of the one of the the, the phrases that bothered me the most, I mean, I really I literally bothered me. It would anger me is when they would say that Jesus is the son of God. When they said he was the son of God, that I, I hated that. It bothered me because I knew, you know, we learned Surah Al-Ikhlas in the Quran that, you know, it says that, you know, he, he's not begotten and he doesn't beget. There is no one equal to him, you know, chapter one, Surah 112 in the Quran. And so, you know, I knew these things and, and it bothered me for that they would call him the son of God. And and I felt that Christianity was the number one. I felt like I felt like it was a competition to Islam yeah. and that it was the um, go. I thought you were going to say something. So. So. Um... The cross which you noticed in front of the churches, which you spit at on, spit on it, and after, as you heard the gospel from uh, television, yes. you decided to draw the cross on your chest with the toothpaste. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's quite changed, don't you think so? It was a miracle. It, it really was, you know, and, uh, you, you, you know, I, I'll tell you this, and I know you'll understand this, is that this story, I, I tell it to Muslims, and, I, and I'm, a, I'm a little bit sometimes careful when I tell Muslims, because I think you know what Muslims are going to say. They're going to say, oh, it was a devil that came to you, you know, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm afraid I tell them, you guys, listen. That that's that's almost blasphemy of the Holy Spirit to call the work of the Holy Spirit the work of the devil. And so I'm you know, I'm almost I'm concerned about telling people that. But the fact is, I, I, I really feel like God put me in this position where by doing it that way, I can't deny it. It happened. I was a very committed Muslim. I was you know, a lot of Muslims you know what happened to them is they heard something about Muhammad married a six-year-old girl, or or Muhammad killed a thousand Jews in one day, or Muhammad married his daughter-in-law, or the you know the Quran encourages uh, sex with prepubescent girls, and chapter sixty-five verse four, or encourages the beating of women, chapter four verse thirty-four. And that didn't happen with me. I didn't know all that, and I didn't you know I wasn't. It wasn't like I was unhappy. I was unhappy, but I wasn't unhappy with Islam. The reason I change is because Jesus came to me. <laughs> he did a miracle, you know. And, and 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 I find that with a lot of Muslims, it's that way too. It isn't necessarily that they learn something about Islam that they don't like. It's just that Jesus comes to them. <laughs> and Pe that People do learn about um, Islam. People do learn how to not like Islam. People kind of say, okay, this is not the ideology for me. Oh, therefore, let me pick Christianity. That. Not, that's not how it works. People learn their ideology is awful. 
people learn that they cannot stand and follow that ideology. But the moment once they hear our glorious God and our glorious gospel, that's him who makes people to fall in love with him. It's not, oh, I give up Islam, therefore my alternative is Christianity. No, that's not the case. It is, there is, there is something so beautiful in Lord Jesus Christ. Once people know who he is, once people know what he's done, once people's hearts start beating with Lord Jesus Christ, that's what changes people. That's what makes people to become Christian, not because Islam is awful. Yes, Islam is awful, but in reality, there is something beautiful about our God that touches people, that confronts people, that changes people. Um, you expressed that because you didn't have Jesus, you were dead, and with Jesus you come to life. Can you just tell me a little bit about what kind of changes uh, you noticed or people noticed in you, or what uh, what is what it is look look like to be alive? You know, it's a. Uh... You know, it's like, uh, it's, I kind of feel like, the, you know, the blind man, you know, where, where they came to him and they said, what did Jesus do to you? And he says, well, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know everything, but all I know is I was blind and now I see. Yeah, John chapter you know? 9, yeah. Yes. And so the, I really feel similar to that, you know. It was just like, I, I know I was dead. I know I was dead because I'm alive now, you know. And I'm, I mean... This happened 42 years ago. <laughs> you know, I'm an old man here. And so this happened 42 years ago, and yet he's still here. You know, my heart is still full because he came and he filled that emptiness, you know. And I guess you don't know how empty your heart is until it's filled. Yeah. You know? and, and when it's filled, you realize how empty it was before. And and, and so, you know, so many Muslims, too, you know, they know they know what I'm talking about. If they'll be honest with themselves, they know how empty their heart is. They know how empty their heart is and how they try so hard to fill that emptiness with good works, with, you know, Salah, with Ramadan, with, all, you know, all their hasanat and all their good works and everything. They, but they feel that emptiness. But Jesus comes, and, you know, when he came. You know, he literally just filled that empty place and made me whole. You know, it, it was just like I was unwhole before, and then I became whole because the Holy Spirit was inside of me. And you know, I had a, I had a, a little incident. You know, after I became a Christian, I, I became very. Uh, you know, the first thing I did the day after I got, or a few days after, because it was on a on a Saturday night, and you know, on Monday after school. You know, I used to always walk by that church that I used to spit at. And uh, and and but this day when I was walking home, I actually went to that church and I went to the pastor, you know, and uh, I just asked him, I said, you know, this happened to me. What does it mean? And uh, and he told me, you know, I remember the guy's name. His name was Gary Leif. And I always say it because I'm hoping somewhere he maybe is listening and he can hear it. But I've never seen him since. And. Uh, and he told me the gospel, and he said to me, you know, do you know what sin can't be forgiven? And I said, well, murder? And he said, no, it's rejecting Jesus Christ. And and so he prayed with me. Back then, we had what's called the four spiritual laws. And, and I, you know, I did, I prayed to receive Jesus into my heart. I think he was already in there. And, uh, but, you know, and then I started going to the church, like, uh, every few weeks, I'd go and, and meet with the pastor. But he... Um, but I didn't tell my dad yet that I uh, that I had uh, become a Christian. You know, I kind of understood. You know, from the moment Jesus came to me that night when I, I did the cross on my chest, in my heart, I understood that there was going to be some repercussions. He would be upset. Yes, yeah. and I knew that Islam has specific repercussions for people like me. I know what I know. We're called kafir murtad, and and you know you've heard stories about people who left Islam, and, you know, and all this stuff, and how they, you're supposed to be killed. You know, 
Muhammad said, Man bad, man baddal dino fa uqtilu. Who changes his religion, kill him. And, you know, I didn't know that much about Islam, but I knew that. <laughs> and so I knew there was going to be repercussions, but I couldn't deny what happened. And uh, so I didn't tell my dad what happened. But then after a few months, uh, after a few months, my sister, who was in the Middle East at the time, came back to the United States. And uh, this is Fatima. And uh, she was a Muslim at the time, too. And, uh, and I told her what happened. And she was very upset. And she told my dad. And uh, I remember that night I came home from, uh, I was out with my friends. And that night, my sister and my dad were sitting together on the sofa. And they told me, my dad said, Hassan, sit down. And I sat down. And he said, uh, he said, we're family, aren't we? And I said, of course. He said, we're Arabs, aren't we? I said, of course. He said, we're Muslims, aren't we? And uh, I, re I remember that in the Bible, he said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. And, and I said, no, Dad, I'm not a Muslim anymore. And he said, why? I said, well, you know, God changed my life and I'm happy this way, you know, and, uh, you know, he threw a shoe at me <laughs> and asked me to leave the house. And uh, and I was as I was leaving. As I was leaving, he came and he grabbed me and he said and he starts shaking me and he starts telling me Islam is the religion of Allah. And he wasn't very religious before then. He became very religious right then. And. He started going to the mosque, started putting Quran on all the time, and you know he became very religious at that moment, and uh, and he felt, I guess he felt responsible for me having fallen away, because he was so lackadaisical in his Islam and stuff like that, and uh, but then he became pretty religious, and eventually um, uh, he found out that I had been going to church, and. Uh, and so he, there were two churches that I was going to. They were close to my house. Somehow he found out about both of them. I don't know how. And uh, so he went to both of them and said that if my son comes here, I'll sue you. And uh, they both asked me not to come back. And, and, you know, the reason I say that is because I wanted to, you know, they both asked me. They said, listen, you're 15 years old. You're living with your father. You got to honor your father. So, you know, it's probably better that you not come to the church. You know, we'll try to be here for you and stuff. Two churches told me that. And uh, I just want to show you, know, this is Islam, you know, no matter what, like I, I didn't get my head cut off, but there was that element of persecution, you know, that even the churches in the Middle East, imagine in the Middle East, when churches tell, tell Muslims, you hear about this, that a Muslim gets a dream of Jesus, goes to the church, and then the church tells them, oh, no, Allah created you a Muslim and created us Christians, <laughs> crazy stuff like that. And that does happen. And, uh, you know, with me, even in America, the land of freedom, I couldn't go to church because of Islam. And so, um, but eventually my father kicked me out. And when he kicked me out, I went to live with my mother, who's, who was Catholic, you know, and she was remarried. And, and she, you know, of course, when I was there, I could go to church. I started going to church. I started growing in the Lord. And I just love the Lord Jesus. And it just... Uh, for years, I was so committed to church and, uh, you know, just growing in the Lord. I went to the university. I got a degree in journalism. I became a reporter. I worked as a reporter. But I always felt this burden. I felt the burden in my heart to, for the Muslims, that I wanted to tell the Muslims about what happened to me. And I know how Muslims are going to react when you when you tell them uh, when you tell them Jesus died. They're going to say, "Nah, ma, ma kataluma salabu." They didn't kill him. They didn't crucify him. And you tell them that he's the son of God. They're going to say, "No, la, Allahu ahad, Allahu samal lam yalid wal You know, they didn't kill him. I mean, uh, there's only one Allah, and you know the you know the surah. I know what they're going to say, but I knew I knew that the power of the because of what happened with me, I knew that the power is in the seed. If I could just plant the seed in their heart, even if they don't accept it, because that's what happened with me. Someone told me about Jesus. I rejected it. 
But a few a few weeks later, the Holy Spirit came and watered that seed, and poof, a miracle happened. And so that's why I want to plant the seed in the hearts of the Muslims, uh, you know. And they'll, maybe they'll reject it right then. Maybe they'll say, uh, "No, you're a Catholic and all this stuff," like they do. But a few weeks later, the Holy Spirit might come at night, like He did with me, because that's what He did with me, and then bring forth the fruit. And so uh, I had this desire to go back to the Muslims and to tell them about uh, what happened to me, you know, just to tell them what happened to me. And uh, uh, let, let me take you a little bit back. And if you don't want to talk about it, it's absolutely fine. Just verbalize it, brother. Um, what do you think it is? What, what do you think reason is? Like, I know lots of ex-Muslims, and I know lots of those ex-Muslims family are not really, really Muslim. Like, they just fast during the Ramadan, and on Friday, they try to go to mosque. That's it. They do lots of other things, which, according to Islam in West, people shouldn't be doing. But once their child become a Christian suddenly something happens they become like so devoted muslim what do you think reason is that you know it's because uh, first of all islam is they terrify them they say the reason your son and, and i was told this i was told this by my because i have muslim siblings too and i was told this by my, my muslim siblings uh, that if I don't return to Islam, this is one factor. If I don't return to Islam, my dad will go to hell. This is what I was told. And I mean, I've had siblings crying, please come back to Islam or dad will go to hell. Because of me, he'll go to hell. Emotional blackmail. That's emotional blackmail. And my dad is, my dad is illiterate. He doesn't know how to read. He doesn't know that this isn't really written in the Quran, but he's scared to death. He's scared to death. And uh, this is a subject that, but then there's also the guilt. They feel like, oh, I was so careless with my religion. You know, I didn't teach my son. I didn't take him to mosque. I didn't, you know, I didn't watch what he was watching on TV. I didn't do, you know, I let him watch those movies about Jesus. I, you know. And so my father felt the guilt of the guilt of not having been a better Muslim uh, example for me, you know. And so, you know, those are those are, I believe that's one of the biggest factors. And uh, do you think does the community have any role to play in that? Once your neighborhood or your relatives finds out that your son or your daughter become a Christian suddenly shame and honor culture just like cover you all therefore because of that you kind of okay let me just get on with my religion protect the ones left over from the one who walked away yes well you know yeah you know you don't i, I know you've done programs and stuff but about this you know that the greatest shame to a muslim family is that one of your children becomes a Catholic, becomes a morted. You know, the the word morted is so deadly, it's so dangerous, you know, uh, morted meaning apostate. And, uh, you know, it's the greatest disgrace. It's a disgrace to the whole family. The whole family will be labeled the family of the apostate in the Middle East and stuff. And so, you know, it was a great shame to my father. It was a great shame to my whole Muslim family. And, you know, the, uh, that, is, that is probably the biggest factor, you know, is that honor, shame, culture that in the Middle East, everything is based on family honor, family shame. And my dad, you know, he did kick me out. I did go live with my mom. And my dad literally, he told me that he tried to disown me, but my dad is such a good person. <laughs> you know, he's got such a kind heart, you know, he couldn't do it. He could, everybody was telling him, you gotta disown Steve, you gotta, you know, do all this stuff. And he said he tried, but he couldn't, <laughs> you know, cause he, he was really a good guy, you know, he's a victim of this thing. And the poor guy, like I said, he doesn't read, he doesn't know what his books say. 
Yeah. And so he just knows what he hears in the mosque, you know, and from his friends, you know, and... Uh, and um, I think that's something common, mainly for Muslims who live in Muslim-majority countries. Uh, they don't know Islam well. All they do is learn from Imam or hear yeah. from their father, their mother at school and then just do the duties like everyone else does. Uh, no, no need to question because everyone does the same thing. They just don't know. They don't know any better. They don't know any better. And one of the good thing is, it is good in your case, but sometimes it just doesn't work the way um, it worked in your life. But uh, sometimes, yes, we do have family members who who loves you more than their religion some in somehow that they cannot cut everything off from you or they can't kick you out or they just like, can't um i don't know uh get rid of you even though they want but in some occasions sadly we do have people who never uh, haven't spoken to their families or um they don't even know if their family is still alive i know people who've been kicked out from the family like they took their surname um, all those kind of things. So in that, um, in your uh, story, we do give thanks to God for the way he worked in the um, in your father's heart. Um, brother, um, so you were, you don't have to answer the question, of course. You do have lots of freedom in my live stream, brother. Uh, so you stood in front of your family when your father kind of said, oh, we are also all Muslim. What do you think caused you to, what do you think it caused you to say, oh, excuse me, daddy, uh, I am Christian? Because you don't know your faith well enough yet. You are not part of like strong church community. So what was in you made you to stand up and then say, excuse me, I am apostate from now on? Um, well, my father put me on the spot, you know, you know, it was not, it wasn't my whole family. But, it was just but my you sister. could, you could, you could practice Takia. <laughs> I didn't know about Takia. <laughs> you were, you were pretty bad Muslim. You were pretty bad Muslim. <laughs> I didn't know that you're allowed to lie. Darn it. No, I'm just kidding. Because, uh, you know, like I said, literally I had read in the Bible, I remember where uh, Jesus said, Jesus said, uh, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. I mean, it was, I, I remember having read that. Yeah. And I knew, and I also yeah. knew at that moment when my dad asked that, I knew that th this could be dangerous. I knew it could be dangerous. I don't know. I didn't know if there, uh, my dad was a good person and everything, and he would, I don't think he would have done it, but there could have been other people there in the house. There could have been sheikhs, you know, what they do to some people is they kidnap them and, and brainwash them and, and do, you know, take them to the mosque and do stuff, you know. And I knew at that moment that there was a danger. There was a risk. If I, if I don't lie, yeah. there's a risk. But uh, I just couldn't, you know, I just had to be honest and— uh, I, I knew what Jesus said. If you deny me before men, I'll deny it before the Father. And I didn't know that much about Christianity then, but I did know that. Yeah. And I did know, I knew what happened to me. I knew that Jesus did come to me. I knew that Jesus was the truth. You know, a lot of times now Muslims, you know what they say to me, say, oh, you didn't pray, you didn't do fast Ramadan, you didn't do that. So you weren't really a Muslim anyway. You know, so you don't know the truth, of the, the, the sweetness of Islam, halawat al-Islam. <laughs> you know, that's what they tell me. If you knew the sweetness of Islam and, and you know, praying seven, five times a day and doing wudu and doing all those things, you would just love it and you would have, it would have been so wonderful and everything. You know, they tell me stuff like that. And, you know, and, and it's like, you know what? I didn't know Allah. When I was a Muslim, I was very committed to Islam. I was very committed. I wasn't wishy-washy. I wasn't like some of these lukewarm uh, American Muslims. I was very committed to Islam. And I was very committed to Allah. I was very committed to Islam, to Muhammad. And, you know, I tried to know Allah, but I couldn't. 
But when Jesus came, I did know him. I did know him. I did not know Allah. I did know Jesus. And, you know, this is what Jesus said to the Samaritan woman. You know, Jesus didn't uh, uh, expound the Samaritan religion to her. But, you know, when she said, oh, we worship on this mountain, but you worship in that mountain and all this kind of stuff. Jesus said, you know, Jesus' only problem with the Samaritan religion, he, the only thing he mentions about it, he says, he says the Jews, uh, uh, your problem is you don't know what you worship. But we do know because salvation is of the Jews. You see, and, and so that thing where you can actually know your God. When I was a Muslim, I didn't know my, I wanted to know my God, but I didn't know him. He's way off over there. I don't know where he is. And he, and, he, and he doesn't interact with me. He doesn't come and comfort me. He doesn't come and touch me. He's not the comforter. But Jesus is. And he did come. And he comforted me. And he filled my empty, miserable life. And he did that. I don't know why he did it. I don't deserve that he did it that way. But he did do it that way. I that's it. the thing we do not deserve but out of his grace he poured himself upon us we do right. not deserve and there is nothing in us attracts him to us but he still did it he still did it today whatever we can say about our god however we express how we know our god because eternal son of the father stepped into this broken world and gave himself for us once for all. That's that's the reason. I must express I am it happens quite a lot, but I, I every time when I hear my heart just not only gets broken but it gets crushes. Hearing churches turn to ex Muslims and then say, Oh, something might not work you've got to honor your family please go back and then deal with your family issues and then once everything is fixed everything is all good come here or go to another church we don't want any trouble it happens quite a lot and every time when i hear it happens even i didn't know it happens in the state but it still crushes my heart uh our churches needs to repent for that churches needs to Take it serious and repent for that because it is our duty to look after baby believers. It is our duty to help um, our brothers and sister sisters to grow in the love and knowledge of Lord Jesus Christ. And if we are not doing that, we are not being church at all. Simply it stands out for repent. Um. So how did you, you've been Christian for a long time now. Uh, why are you now, like, I know you have written books and you are kind of engaging with Muslims in many different ways. Um, why are you today Christian? Okay, when you were at age 15, something happened, caused you to be shaken and accept Lord Jesus Christ as your savior. But... It's been a long time. What is it keeping you in Christ? Well, you know, kind of alluded to that uh, he came inside and he's still there. He's still here. I know he's here. He hasn't left you? He did. I deserve that he, he should have. He should have left me. I deserve that he leave, but he didn't. Once and every he time picks you, there is nothing can separate. No one can cast us out from him. And it's not just some imaginary thing that I'm saying, oh, I have this faith, this blind faith. No, it's tangible. I know he's here. I know he's here. And he, you know, and, you know, they're, 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 this question probably could deal in two different areas. One is, the reality of Christ is why I'm still a Christian. But why won't I go back to Islam? <laughs> you know, I, I didn't leave Islam because of, 
you know, Muhammad's six-year-old bride or, or, you know, the fact that he was 54 and had sex with a nine-year-old girl. That's not why I left Islam. But now that I know that, that's the reason I could never go back. When I hear, now that I know the truth about what Jesus saved me from, the fact that Muhammad married a six-year-old girl when he was 51 years old, had sex with her when he was 54, she was nine, she was so terrified her hair fell out. You see, I used to live in the Middle East. I was a missionary in the Middle East, and I used to live in a war zone. One day, I went, we were doing, we were handing out food to the poor, and we went to the house of this widow, and she had three little girls, and then she brought one of the little girls, and she said, yeah, look at her, her hair is falling out. This little girl, her hair is falling out. She was bald in parts of her head. And I said, why is her hair falling out? She said, because she hears the, the sounds of the tanks firing and the bullets at night and the airplanes. She's so scared her hair falls out. It says in the Hadith, Aisha says, my hair fell out. So when I hear these imams saying, what's his face? Oh, dude, what's the guy who did the big embarrassment, Yasser Qadi. Yasser Qadi says, well, I don't see why you guys are so upset about Aisha. She wasn't mad. She was a happy wife. She was such a happy wife. She never complained. She had a great life. Why are we upset about what she's not upset about? That's what Yasser Qadi said. But Aisha in the Hadith says, my hair fell out. Yep. Her, she was terrified. She didn't and, even know what was happening. And how many girls are still going through that because of what Muhammad did, you know? And, and you know what? I'm still waiting on my live stream. <laughs> I'm waiting, and I'm probably going to put money behind. I'm going to, maybe I'll start offering money. I want a Muslim to come on and say it's wrong for a 54-year-old man to have sex with a 9-year-old girl. I just want him to say that. It's wrong for a 54-year-old man to have sex with a 9-year-old girl. Just come on and say that. Had one that was willing to say that yet, and so now that I've, I'm learning about Islam, and I'm feeling a responsibility. You know, like just recently, I've started doing. You know, I was, you know, could I show some of my books here? Yes. So uh, you 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 are about to move very fast. Let's let's um, slow on that. So, um, how many books have you written so far, brother? I've written about uh, ten books. Wow. You know, that's yeah. a lot of writing. Yeah, but it's not a lot of money. So. <laughs> uh, well, that's something you needed to think before you write them. So you, you've you written approximately 10 books. Yes. Um, can we go through some of them and then tell us what are they about? And then also I'd love to hear um, what have you been doing in your Christian life? What is your ministry look like, if that's okay with you? Sure, absolutely. Um, I have this book. This is like one of the main books that I kind of wanted to show. And uh, this one, this book is very special. Now, this book I wrote like uh, 12, 13 years ago. It's, it, it has a different title now. And I, I sent you the picture. I hope it came. It's, it's now called Another Fold. It's called Another Fold. You know where Jesus says, I have another fold and I must go to them. You know, another sheepfold, meaning, you know, when he said, he says, I must go get them. Jesus says that I have sheep of another fold. I must go get them. He was talking to the Jews, saying that there's these Gentile sheep that he's got to go. He said, I must go get them. And so Jesus, you know, and, and the Muslims are among that fold. And so it's called another fold. And uh, so if you put that, it's in, available on, on Amazon and uh but anyway, this book right here is very special to me because these, these are testimonies of Muslims that I led to the Lord or that I met personally and I heard their testimonies. Uh, let, let, me, let me just get that right, brother. So nothing personal in this, okay? So you are just telling us like once upon a time you left Islam, blah, blah. That can just people can easily forget that. I understood that Islam was like so beautiful religion people wouldn't leave it yet you put together a book talking about people 
who left Islam, correct? Correct. So Islam is so beautiful, people are running away from it. By the millions. Okay. Um, why don't you share a couple of stories from the book from the book for us? Okay. Now yeah. these are people I know personally. Okay, by I the just a moment. If if you are gonna share the story, that doesn't mean like please in the brothers and beloved ones, buy the book, read the stories, get encouraged, be confident our God is actively at work. But yes, brother, if you can share a couple of stories, you don't have to, of course, but if you share, that will be um, encouraging to us. Okay. There was a guy in the Middle East. This is in the Middle East that happened. This is a guy that I met. I did not lead this guy to the Lord, but I met him and spoke with him. And what happened is he was a soldier. He was a soldier and, uh, at, at a particular uh, a check stop, you know, where they would stop the cars and... Uh, I checked the cars yeah. and they, they let flag the people through. And he was sitting on his post, you know, and then a car drove by and there were these American girls in the car. And one of them gave him this little green book. And so he just said, okay, sure. You know, and he put it in his pocket and then he went home that, uh, or to his barracks, you know, he was in the military. And so he went to his barracks and he was asleep that night. And, and he, he laid down to go to sleep, and then he felt the, and he, he remembered the book. And so he took the book, and he said, okay, I'll read it. It turns out it was the Gospel of Luke. And he was reading it, and as he read it, he fell asleep. And then as he was asleep, this is what he said. He shared his testimony. And he said that as he, as he was sleeping, he said he felt warm water coming down his face. And so he put his hand like this to wipe the warm water off his face. But then he looked at his hand. It wasn't water. It was blood. And then he looked up like that, and he was in front of the cross, and the blood of Jesus was coming down on him. And he was like, he woke up. He was terrified. What does this mean? And then he, he went and looked for a Christian. In his country, it's a Muslim country. He looked for a church to tell him, what does this mean? And the church said, oh, Allah, Allah made you a Muslim and he made us Christians. And so, you know, you got a great religion. Allah keep you and protect you. And so, you know, be strong in your religion. We'll be strong in our religion. He told him that. And, and he said, and so he was just, he went to another church. It says, oh, brother, you know that Allah made us each of us the way he made us. And so we love each other. We, we Muslims and Christians love each other. We're brothers and we just always hand in hand. And you know, we, that, you know, that's a great thing about our religions. We love each other. And they wouldn't tell him what it means. Finally, he went to what uh, a, a Christian bookstore and he found an American missionary and he told him what happened. And the American missionary took him to the Bible and read with him what that meant. He accepted the Lord. The Holy Spirit came on him. He knew the power of the Holy Spirit. And he knew that this was the truth. And then he called up his wife to tell her. His wife went and told her family. And they said, you better not come back here. And, and he kept on, but he loved his family. He had little kids, like six kids, and he just, he didn't want to give up on his family. So he just kept trying to go back. Eventually, he did work his way back. And just through a series of events, his wife got saved, and one by one, his children got saved. And he shared the testimony of the, the youngest girl. She was like five years old. And one day, they were all sitting at a table together. And then the little girl, she starts smiling, and she says, hey, you know, everybody, I just want to tell you something. And they go, well, what's wrong? What's going on? And she said, well, I accepted Jesus today. Or, you know, in their language, how they would communicate it. <laughs> and his whole family got saved. And they were all in church together. And I met this guy, and he shared his testimony. And, you know, and so... This, this is one of the stories that's in here, by the way, okay? This is somebody I met. I'd like to tell you about somebody that I actually led to the Lord. <laughs> okay, I used to live in the Middle East and in a war zone. And, and uh, one day, 
uh, and then I lived in this building, and in this building, uh, you know, it was in a Muslim, very, very committed Muslim area, and uh, and one day I was watching the Jesus movie. Okay, now I didn't always watch the Jesus movie, but I was watching it that day, and uh, and and then one of the employees of the building came into my room, into my house. You know, he was a friend of mine. He would he'd always come in and stuff, and and then he looked at the screen that I was watching the Jesus movie. And he said to me, he says, who's that? You know, when he saw Jesus, he said, who's that? And, and I told him, well, it, you know, it's an actor, but he's playing Jesus. And he said, he came to me in my dream last night. And I said, really? He said, yeah, he came to me and, and he was smiling. And he said, you're my son and I'm coming back. What does that mean? And I told him what it meant, and I prayed with him, and he received the Lord. And then, a few weeks later, <laughs> this same guy, a few weeks later, he comes up to me, and he says, he said, I had another dream. And I said, what was the dream? He said, he, he said that I was talking to him in the dream. And in the dream, I said something in English. But he didn't understand the English. <laughs> He's Arab. He didn't understand the English. He, I said, do you know what I said in English? He said, yeah. He said, you, you said, do as I do. What does that mean? And he didn't know, you know. And I told him what it means, you know. I told him in Arabic, do as I do. And he said, uh, and I said, was there anything else in the dream? He said, yeah. He said, I was doing wudu, you know, where you wash your hands and feet before you pray. He said, but in the dream, I told him, I said to him, no, no, that's not the way. Let me show you the right way. And then I dunked him in a pool of water. <laughs> he said, what does that mean? <laughs> and I told him what it meant. And, and, and a few days later, I said, you come over, I'm going to baptize you in my bathtub. And so <laughs> I baptized him in my bathtub, you know. And uh, so, you know, this is this is this is another one of the of the stories that's in here. It's a true story. I know the, you know, I know the person. And uh, can I just tell one more short one? Sure. And then okay. I will ask a couple of questions. Okay. This other story. What happened is uh, I was in this city, uh, and if I said it, everybody in the planet knows the city, and. Uh, and I was talking to, the, we went, after church, we went to have coffee, me and this other Christian guy, and the, and there was a Muslim waiter. A Muslim waiter came, and, uh, you know, he took our order, and then he sat down to talk to us, you know, and then we were talking, and I was to telling him about Jesus and everything. And this guy was a Muslim, but he loved Jesus, you know, he, he really loved Jesus. In fact, he showed me he had a picture of Jesus in his wallet, even though he's a Muslim. And... And I said, great. I said, I, and I asked him, we talked a while. And then I told him, do you want to receive Jesus into your heart? You know, that's, you know, and I told him my testimony, how the Holy Spirit came and all this stuff. And, and he goes, he goes, no, I love Jesus, but I'm a Muslim, you know. And, and I said, I said, okay, I don't want to pressure you or anything. And uh, about seven months later, about seven months later, I was still living in the Middle East. I get a phone call. And, and and it's it's this guy, and and he he says to me he says Hussein I said yeah how you doing you know and he says good he says and then I'll say it in Arabic first he said illi aja alik aja alayye which means in English the one who came to you came to me <laughs> about and I said Jesus. He said, yes, Jesus. He said he was sitting in his kitchen and, and he was so overwhelmed with all his problems and all his, you know, it was it was a wartime. It was he was he wasn't able to go to his job, all the finances, his family problem, his wife problem, everything. He was so devastated. And he said that all of a sudden he saw this light in the window and he knew that it was Jesus. And he just it was just a similar experience with what I had. And he came, he accepted the Lord. I said, is it Jesus who came to you? You, you, you know when he told me that? He said, uh, the one who came to you came to me. 
I didn't want to believe it. I, I mean, I did want to believe it, but I thought, no, this is too good to be true. So I tried changing the subject. How's your wife? How's your kids? How's your family? And everything like that, you know? But then he, he said, he said, Hsin, listen to me. The one who came to you came to me. And I said, Jesus. He said, yes, Jesus. And he described it to me. And it was so amazing. Was, he said he felt the Lord put his hand on his shoulder and the comfort of the Holy Spirit come on it. He said, I never felt peace like that before. And so he ended up giving his life to the Lord. And, you know, and so, you know, there are many millions of stories like this. This is happening all the time with Muslims. With Muslims. It's happening. I know it happens with others, but it is happening with Muslims in an amazing way. Dreams. You know, they did a study. How do Muslims come to the Lord? Top five ways. Number one, they meet Hatun Tash. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they, the number one is the, is the internet. The number one is the internet right now. That's the number one way Muslims come to the Lord. Num uh, and the number two way is that they had met a Christian at some point, and then years later, something happens in them. But, you know, the, like the number three way is dreams and visions. They have these dreams and they, they, you always hear, you know, that's why you see, you see the picture on here that with the white robe. They always say a man in a white robe came to me <laughs> and, and, and he said, I'm the son of God. Or he said, I'm, I'm your savior or go talk to this person or something like that, you know. And so anyway, so that's why I wrote this book just to uh, because that's kind of what happened to me, too. You know, I did not see Jesus with my eyes. But I know he I knew who he's there. And this is happening to so many Muslims. And a lot of Muslims, this has happened to them, and they don't know what happened yet. It already happened to them. So, anyway. So, brother, let me just um, ask very first basic question. Is this book is available in Amazon? Yes, it is. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. It, but but it, it's, called, it's called Another Fold. Yeah, it's on the screen. Okay. Oh, okay. Book book is available. Please, please do um, get it. It will help us to it will help us to uh, get encouraged wa by what Lord is already doing. Uh, also, as we hear uh, from Brother Steve that um, people are, are having dreams and visions and coming to Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, of course, people can have lots of lots of dreams. Muhammad claimed to have dreams, all those kind of things. Important thing is, are they your dreams can be supported with any story from the Bible, from the Christian scripture? Because, like, I remember once um, someone said, like, they had a dream, therefore they become a Muslim. You never know. <laughs> they heard, like, this screaming voice, and then they, oh, yeah, that's Islam, let me become Muslim. So we need to check out those dreams. Okay, um, people find your book on Amazon because there was a comment that they couldn't find the book in Amazon. Uh, so we need to check those dreams and then explain those dreams to individuals. People, most of people don't know what it means. Therefore, they need to be preached our glorious gospel so that they, they accept it. Because we don't want people to just fall in love, fall in love with this guy who they saw in their dream and then stuck there. There needs to be they need to know Jesus Christ is the eternal son of the father. They need to know there is eternal way, eternal life only and only through death and resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. Not because this white man come and then they just had 10 minutes dream and then life just get back to normal. So basic needs to be go through with them. Um, just a practical question, since like you've been in the field for a long time and you've got lots of experience. I'm so old. Say it again. I'm so old. <laughs> you, you are not old. 57. That's, uh, not, that's not old. I remember when I was 57. Uh, <laughs> and then after that, like you go back. Once you hit the 58, you go back. I remember... Once upon a time, I was 57. <laughs> um, because 
you've been in the field for a long time. You are engaging with Muslims. You are writing books. Um, it's not like you led people to Jesus, but you, Lord Jesus was willing to use you to bring people to himself. Um, one of the things even I experienced from this part of the world is, like currently in the ministry, we've got over 300 ex-Muslims who become a Christian and uh, we haven't able to pluck them into churches. So once someone becomes a Christian, our goal is to pluck them into the churches or link them with the Christians in the area they live. If they are in England, it's much easier, but when they are in different parts of the world, that can be difficult. And this is the, like similar what what you um, heard. It is practically stressful. Like I had to breathe out and breathe in when I try to hunt down the Christians in Muslim majority countries to plug in ex-Muslim um, or encourage ex-Muslim to attend the church because church says actually um, church says actually it's all the same God or like don't come to us because we don't want trouble. Like I've got over 300 people. I have to like do lots of discipleship study every week because I couldn't plug them into churches. What have you learned so far that you can kind of give me some tips when I speak those um, churches or those beloved? Uh, I can like find the ways to help them to look after the new believers or help new believers to uh, become part of the church instead of just sending them back to saying, oh, actually, it's all the same God. Uh, you are chosen to be Muslim, blah, blah, that like vocabulary. Get rid of that vocabulary and then put them, uh, plug them into churches and into Christian with the Christians link them. What are the tips you can give it to me? You know, uh, you know they've they've done studies about this situation. For instance, like in in the Middle East, for instance, like uh, or, or countries where there are Christians, there are some Christians, you know, but and there are churches, you know, you know, not like like Saudi Arabia or anything like that, but like in like countries where there are churches, they've found that small churches usually are not able to absorb. Uh, ex-Muslims because of the, the you know usually it's because of the danger uh, usually in a small church it uh, it's very easy to, for them to be watched and to be uh, you know by the government or by the neighbors and by the community and they'll see who's going and who's leaving and so it's it presents a danger to the church and to the ex-Muslim and so at medium-sized churches are usually able to absorb an, an ex-Muslim, you know, and to be able to minister to them. And I mean, this is just a study that they did. I'm not saying this is right or wrong. This is the way, this is the results of the study. And then the big churches are able to absorb them, you know, and to preserve their, their uh, anonymity, you know, for those that, you know, so that they're not, you know, their families don't know about them and stuff. But so you, you know, don't, so you don't have any practical tips you can give it to me that I can use it to blackmail the churches. <laughs> what? Why are you laughing at me, brother? No, that's uh, you, you know the uh, what what I was gonna say is that what I found with ex-Muslims is you know in the areas that I've been is that the. I found that the, the ex-Muslims sometimes have to, have to make their own church, you know, that the ex-Muslims sometimes need to make their own churches, at least for a while, that, you know, that they have to gather together and to be together, you know, because they all understand that this is just from my own experience. And, I, you know, I only lived in the Middle East uh, nine years as a missionary. And these are the struggles that I went through in the area that I was living at, is that I found, because I did, you know, I, did, I, I, I took ex-Muslims with me to church, and they ended up quite often getting beaten, often getting ostracized, and they'd stop coming. 
you know, and it and the church tried sometimes to accept to take them in. And but, the, you know, quite often the problem sometimes the, the problems that I saw when I was there was that it was the families of those, those ex-Muslims who found out about it. And they're the ones who made problems for the ex-Muslim to where they stopped coming. And uh, and the church, it, you, you know, it, it, it did try to, you know, and I'm not saying that all churches do try, but the church that I was at did try. And eventually what we had to do when I was there, this is what I did. I had to just start something for the ex-Muslims by ourselves. And I hate that. I hate that. When I got saved, I didn't have to do that. When I got saved, I didn't have to do that. And it, it makes me mad that they had to do that. And it's not fair. It made me angry. It made me angry at the churches. It made me angry at everything. But I found that that's what we had to do. And even when we did that, and we did that, but even when we did that, we got in trouble. And the government got involved. And we had to disband. You know, and so there's, you know, there's very real. <laughs> uh, the danger is, is unfortunately, this is what Muhammad left. Man baddal dinu fa uqtilu. It's the highest sin. And I don't need to tell you. I don't need to tell him. You guys all know this already. And so we have to be creative in the ways that we try to take care of the ex-Muslims. And, and the thing, you know, uh, what, you know, another thing too is that we have that praise be to God is the internet. Praise God for the internet, that we're able to communicate with them. We're able to disciple them over the internet. And, uh, you know, th that's been my experience. It, it, it's a little bit limited. And uh, I don't know if you could blackmail a church with it, but it's like, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's what's been my experience. Um, thank you very much for that advice, brother. Um, there is a question for you. I'll bring it up. It is kind of personal question. You have all the rights in my live stream to not answer the question, but I'll bring it up. Uh, did your mother agree for you to go with your father after their divorce? No. No. Okay. And uh, by the way, this is a very common situation. And uh, sometimes they call it kidnapping. And I'm not saying that's what happened to me. But it happens, it happens a lot. Thank you very much for answering that personal question. Um, okay, that was first book of out of 10. Where is the second book, brother? Um, you know, uh, this one is still the same name. And you, you know what? The Lord put it on my heart to write this book. Do I have and, that one? Did you send that to me? Oh, you know what? I'm not sure if I sent. I, it's called Son of Mary. It's very, I didn't send it to you. I'm sorry. Um, no. But. But 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 it's easy to find though. It's on Amazon. This is my okay. this is this my best, this is my best seller. I've sold over thirteen copies of it. And so <laughs> that was a joke. But okay, the uh, <laughs> I usually sell like one or two of them. I have it in Arabic and in English. By the way, it's called Ibn Miriam in Arabic and Son of Mary. This is how to use the Quran to witness to Muslims. You know, like uh, uh, to uh, it's, Son of Mary, what did Muhammad say about Jesus? Yeah. You know, like saying that, you know, the Quran says that Jesus died. You know, it says, Allah said to, to Jesus, says, I made okay. you to die and raise you up to myself. The Quran says Jesus is God. It says, you know, that, <laughs> yeah, so you how, know. It's about so, how do we use the Islamic teachings to make a case that Jesus is the eternal son of the, son of the Father, who gives eternal life. Yeah, and it's kind of like for Christian. It's really for Christians. It's not to edify Christians. I had one Christian woman take it, and she was so excited after she heard about all the miracles and everything about Muslims, and she went and she wanted to edify her spirit by reading this. 
It's not going to edify your spirit. <laughs> it's going to depress the heck out of you if that's what you try to do. It's to give you hints to use the Quran to preach to Muslims. That's what this book is for. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's like about the deity of Christ, about the crucifixion, about the Son of God, about you know proofs in the Quran that Jesus is God, the yep. deity of Jesus Christ. So anyway, that, that's called Son of Mary, and that is on Amazon. It's, maybe uh, we can make it. Maybe we can do a session on how to how to use that material. Sure, and then that um, of course that doesn't mean like don't buy the book. So you buy the book, people. <laughs> like don't think like okay, this is yeah, it's gonna do a session about it. Let me not buy the book. Don't do that. <laughs> get the book. It will. It, it is good that we get to have. Um, we get to learn new informations in the intention. We want to use it to challenge the teachings of Islam so that Muslim people can walk through the bridge Lord Jesus Christ built with his death and his resurrection. Because bridge is already there. We cannot use the sources to build bridges. Bridge is already being built by Lord Jesus Christ. All we've got to do is make sure our Muslim friends are listening, hearing, and doing something about it. Sorry about um, this, right, it, this is another book, and it's called The Gray Zone, and it, it, I don't have it. It's not called this anymore. Uh, I've changed it. This was like 15 years ago I wrote this. And The Gray Zone is what I consider, you know, like what that Muslims go through. That sometimes what happens is a Muslim learns the truth about Muhammad or the Quran or something, and he leaves Islam. But he's not yet ready to accept the Lord Jesus. And so I call that The Gray Zone. That between the time that he leaves Islam and comes to Jesus, you know, and uh, but now this book, I, I changed the format of it a little bit, and it's called A Hundred and One Nights. A Hundred and One Nights. And it's in the format of A Thousand and One Nights. If you know that book, it's a very famous book, The Thousand and One Nights. It was Time Magazine's book of all time. It was uh, a, a Persian Arabic book called in Arabic Elf Leila Ulele. It's a very famous, one of the most famous Arabic books in the world after the Quran. And uh, but it's made in the format of that, and it's called One Hundred and One Nights by Steve Mash. And these stories, I did not lead these people to the Lord, but I heard their testimonies. And uh, and uh, if I could just tell one of the testimonies, because it's it just is such an amazing testimony. I'll, I'll tell it real quickly. Um, there's one guy who, who loved books. He was, from the moment he could touch a book, he fell in love with books. He loved to feel books. He loved to smell books. He loved to, you know, he said he felt like the spirit of people was inside the book. They could, he could understand, you know, uh, he just loved books. And he was a Muslim. Uh, in, uh, I think I could say he was in Syria. And he owned, and as he got older, he owned a, book, a Muslim bookstore. It became one of the most famous Muslim bookstores in Syria. In fact, it was so famous that all Muslims considered it almost like a pilgrimage to go to his bookstore because it was, he had every kind of book, Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih everything, and all the hadith, all the commentaries, he had everything in this book. And, uh, and so he was, he just loved books so much. And then, but one day, somebody asked him about, well, do you have the Injil, the gospel? And he says, he said, well, you know, he said, I have this one Injil, but this is the corrupted one, the one that the Christians say, but we don't have the real one. And he said, and so, but so he gave it to the guy. But then he started thinking, well, if there is an Injil, where is this? Where's the real one? <laughs> where's the real Injil? <laughs> and so he started looking. And this guy had contacts all over the world in Egypt, Alexandria, in Europe, in Germany, in Holland in England. He had contacts with all the big book publishers and everything. You know, they all knew him. He was so famous for his book, his Islamic bookstore. And he looked and looked and Vatican everywhere looking for the real gospel. Where is the real Injil? He looked and looked and looked and, and, and I mean, years this took him as he's, he's, he became an obsession. He was obsessed with it. I need to find the real Injil. He says, I got every book in the universe about Islam here. I want the real Injil. And he looked and looked and looked, and he just got so frustrated. And eventually one day he just thought, you know what? I'm just going to look at the, at the Injil that I got, you know, this old one. 
and he started reading it. <laughs> and when he started reading it, the Holy Spirit started working in his heart. And he knew this is the real Injil. He ended up giving his life to the Lord, had to sell his bookshop and fled to Europe because he knew he'd be killed. And so uh, <laughs> what a story, man. And this is the guy. <laughs> so anyway, that's the book is called 101 Nights. It's kind of a fantasy, you know, kind of like a uh, format, but the stories in them are true. So, okay. Thank, thank you very much for writing them and even sharing with us because it is great encouragement to us. Um, what are your thoughts before you move to the next book? I know you get like lots of books are coming. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, people to give up Islam but stuck in the in the between? Not like well, pick any religion or just leave, leave Islam and just identify as ex-Muslim. What are your thoughts on that? Do you see there is a danger or you see that as a positive step? Uh, I, you know, you, you, you're still going to hell um, <laughs> as a Christian. You know, my concern is I don't want you to go to hell. If you leave Islam, you're still going to hell. The idea isn't to leave Islam. I don't care what I don't care where you're from. I don't care where you're from. I care where are you your destination? Where are you going? You need to come to Jesus. That's what we want. The main thing is come to Jesus Christ, not you know, I, I don't care about Islam. You know, and for like, I was a Christian like 25 years before I even opened the Quran again. I was a Christian like 25 years before I even touched the Quran again. I didn't want to touch it. I don't want to touch it. And to tell you the truth, I don't even have one in my house. I can't sleep when I have a Quran in my house. I, I, you know, I don't want it. But, you know, I realize that I need to learn it. I need to study it in order to reach Muslims. And so I've been doing that. And it's painful for me. I mean it. I don't like to do it, but I do it because, you know, it's like Paul says, I become all things to all men. And so I have to, in order to be able to communicate with the Muslims, I study the Quran, I study the Hadith, I study the Sirah Nabawiyah and all these things in order to reach Muslims. But I hate them. I, I, I just be honest, I hate them. I hate them, you know. But uh, so for a Muslim to leave Islam and to get stuck in, you know, it, you know, it's so common. You know what? I heard I heard a statistic that one out of five Muslims have left Islam. One out of five, 20% of Muslims have left Islam. I think and it's more than that now, brother. Come on. It's not Woo! only it's not only they are leaving Islam, they are beco becoming lovers of Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we want. That's what we want, you see. <laughs> And we, mm. as I said, like we are struggling to find people to disciple them, like because it reached um, in that um, in that Lady. place. Um, okay, what else have you written, brother? Okay, uh, th this is my autobiography. It's called the history of sin. No, move, that's a move, that's move a joke. <laughs> that's a joke you guys that's a joke no this is a book called about the history of sin in the bible okay it's not about islam it's move, just about move it a bit, little bit to left okay that's it yeah okay the history of sin yeah so that's the book that's the book we need to buy it to know like okay what is your heart looks like <laughs> no, no, that's a joke. But no, I did write that. But it's just a, a Bible study about sin. But I did write my autobiography. I don't have a picture of it, but I sent it to you. It's called The Apostate. That's my life story. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, that, that, that book opens, if I could just tell the, the story at the beginning of it, when I was a missionary in the Middle East. One time I was mistaken, uh, I was mistaken for, uh, for someone else and, uh, some guys chased me in my car and shot my car 14 times and I was in the car and nothing happened to me 14 times the, in the morning. We saw how many bullet dings in the car. There were 14 dings in the car. I don't think it could have been two bullets that did it. when I I felt two bullets go through the the metal when they were shooting, 
and I was I was terrified. I wasn't this great Elijah or e Isaiah. I was terrified, running like a chicken. I was so terrified, and uh, but God saved me. God saved me out of that. And so that's the first story that's in there is about that incident. And it's the name of the story is The Apostate. And so that's also available on, on Amazon. And so uh, anyway, if anybody wants to read that story, it's there. So, Thank so you. those are the books, yeah. Thank you very much for sharing them and writing them. Uh, more? Have you got more? More books? Yeah. You said um, you've written 10, so I'm counting. It hasn't been 10 yet, brother. Uh, if you don't uh, have the 10 with you, I will ask a couple of questions. Okay. Um, you, you, you know, <laughs> so, uh, there's some that are not related to Islam, but they are indirectly related to Islam. For instance, one of them is called The Trees of Abraham. That was the first book I wrote. And... Uh, it's called the trees of Abraham, and it talks about the different trees in the life of Abraham. And there's, I saw seven trees in the life of Abraham. For instance, when he came to uh, the Holy Land, and when he first came, he came to a tree called the the oh, great oak of Shechem, uh, in which is Nablus today in Palestine. And he came there. That was the first when he came to the Promised Land. The first place he came to was a tree, and then there was the tree uh, when he was going to sacrifice Isaac, and and it says that there was a ram in the thicket. And then there was a tree when Hagar threw Ishmael. It says she threw him under a tree. And so there's all these trees in the life of Abraham. So the, the name of the book is The Trees of Abraham. It's not related to Islam, but indirectly it is because of Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and stuff. So that's there, too. And it's also on Amazon. All these books are on Amazon. So, okay. yeah, those are the I think those are the main ones. Yeah. OK. Um, so beloved ones, do check them out and. Get them, read them. It will help you to uh, get encouraged and see how Lord is actively at work. Because we do hear lots of those stories, but sometimes it's good to read them, even keep the book. The moments when you are feeling like discouraged, remembering those stories will help us. Um, so besides writing books for your long Christian journey, uh, what else? I think Coke makes you hyper. <laughs> uh, what else have you been doing, brother? Well, I have a... Uh, I was... Uh, the way I we, we started communicating was that, you know, I worked with... I, I, I worked... I was on television for like 10 years. I had a TV show. So you are famous. Fall. I'm sorry? You are famous. I'm very famous. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That so, people wanted to kill you. That means if someone is famous, you don't go close to them. Okay. Don't ever sin with brother Steve on the street because he will put your life in danger. I'm just, I'm just joking, brother. Sorry. Yeah. I'm so famous that, you know, I, I, I you know, I'm drinking uh, diet Coke and uh, no, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm famous, but not rich. So, but anyway, the Lord opened the door. You know, when I went to the Middle East I, I, as a missionary for nine years, one thing that happened is when I was living there, I saw how powerful satellite television was. Satellite, Christian satellite television is so powerful. It is so effective. Father Zechariah was so powerful. God used him so mightily. Everybody hated him, but they couldn't help watch him. <laughs> and he was destroying the foundations, the pillars of Islam. And I was there because I was living there. This is before I knew anything about satellite TV or Christian TV or anything. I, I mean, I did know about Christian TV. I got saved through TV. So I believe in the power of television. Absolutely. But when I started, when I lived there, I saw the impact of Christian satellite television and the don't let people talk against it. Never let people talk against it. God is using it. It's going to the Kaaba. It's going to Mecca. And they're preaching the gospel there where Christians haven't been able to preach the gospel for since 1400 years. But they are there. They're in Tehran. 
they're in the palace uh, palaces in, in Saudi Arabia. They are. And they're winning people to Christ. And so anyway, I got to see the power of Christian, Arabic Christian television. And so when I came back to the U.S. in 2010, the Lord just bing, 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 you know, the way he does. He leads your footsteps. And he led me to meet Father Zechariah. <laughs> and I had known about him in the Middle East. And I know how they feel about him. <laughs> I actually got to meet him. And so when I got to meet him, he was starting a TV station called El Fadi. And, uh, and he just asked me to come do a program in English. And I did. It was a program called uh, Message of Grace. And it was on Father Zechariah's station for uh, almost 10 years. And uh, it, was almost, it was a live program uh, every other week. We did it. And it's still on the air on his channel, El Fadi. And uh, so I did that for like about 10 years. I had Jay Smith on. I had Dave Wood. I did a program with David Wood. For, I did many programs with David Wood. He, uh, in fact, we did a show together, me and David Wood, called Answering Muslims, and uh, we did like 26 episodes together. And then uh, also I had Brother Sam Shimon on with me, and I had uh, uh, many ex-Muslims, and uh, it was a it was an awesome experience, and uh, you know. Uh, it was satellite TV going all over the world and through on the internet. So it was just such a blessing to be able to do that. I did that for about 10 years. And then, um, and now I'm, I'm no longer doing that. I'm no longer on the TV station, but now I'm just doing my Facebook. I started doing Facebook, uh, live streams and, uh, I've, uh, entered into a new level of opposition, persecution, hatred, rejection, everything which you you know very well. And uh, for me, it was new because it was so, on TV, it's like, you know, people are way out there and you're, you know, inside a, uh, you know, a little studio, you know, but on Facebook, it's almost like you're face to face being beat up. And, beat <laughs> and so this is a whole new experience for me doing this. And, uh, and I started doing it and I made a lot of stupid mistakes. I did a lot of stupid things. Uh, but one day, one day I thought, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore because uh, it hurts so much to do this. And, and, I, and I took a nap. And then when I took a nap, I heard a little voice inside of me. And this little voice was like, like crying. And the voice said, I have to keep talking. I have to keep talking. And I just felt that was the Holy Spirit saying to me, you got to keep talking because the devil doesn't stop talking. The devil is still lying to people and they're going to hell because they're not hearing the truth. You got to keep talking. And maybe I only get 100 people watch my views, my, my videos. Maybe I only got 200 people watching my videos. Maybe I say something stupid and make an embarrassment of myself. And, and, and all of that's happened. But it's like I feel I got to keep talking. I, while I got a voice, I got to use that voice for Jesus Christ. I don't know why he came to me the way he did, but he did. I got to keep telling people about it. I don't know why he let me become a Muslim, but he did. And I believe it's for the Muslims that I got to keep talking. So, yeah, so that's what I'm doing now. And I have my, my live stream, if anybody wants to watch it, you know, uh, my it's on uh, Hussein Mashni is my YouTube channel. So go like it, uh, join, become a member. Or, I don't understand all that stuff. I'm too old. But <laughs> um, you, as you were telling me how, how you were confident that Lord revealed himself to you, you expressed that as you were dead, now you are alive. And one of the things you've got to do to make sure that you are still alive is speak, talk, and talk. Glory. Therefore, only thing, only thing we can talk about is, only gossip we can do is gossip of our glorious gospel. Only thing we will never shut up is our gospel, our glorious God. There is no any other way. So continue to speak. <laughs> continue to speak. Can I ask you something? 
do uh -huh. I have to answer? <laughs> I, I am the one I am the one who is asking the questions, brother. But let I just, me I, I will give you time for that. Just let me um say something before before I forget. Because um I uh, there was a time and place I was fifty seven. So therefore I can forget things very easily. Um brothers, I think I put it in the description uh YouTube channel of brother. If I haven't done it, I will do it soon after we finish. So the word we need to do is you go there, you subscribe to the channel. Okay, so once you subscribe, do click the bell or something. There is a bell. And then from that bell, you will know what's happening in that channel. Uh, so that is, I don't know the full vocabulary for that, but clearly I know better than Brother Steve on that. So do that, <laughs> do that and um, follow his work and subscribe to his channel. And um, if I don't know if Facebook does those kind of things because he expressed that he also put those things on Facebook, do that on Facebook. I have zero knowledge on Facebook, but if it's done, please do so. Um, yes, brother, what is your question? Uh, were you eating pretzels? What? Do you know what pretzels are? I don't know what are they, but probably I didn't eat them. I don't. I don't eat the things I don't know. Why? Okay. <laughs> Pretzels are like this twisted. It's like a, a bread stick. Yeah. But it's twisted like this, you know. And uh, I thought you were eating one right now. No, I. I was already very much rude that my phone ring during the live stream. That was already unacceptable. So I'm not gonna <laughs> eat something during the live stream, brother. I have uh -oh. to, I have to, like, put my words together and then, like, apologize you and ask forgiveness nicely for someone just buzzing me in the middle of the live stream. And by the way, my, um, my uh, phone, ninety nine point nine percent is always silent, but in somehow today, first time in my live stream life, went off. I am so sorry about that. That was, uh rude and unacceptable sorry about that um hopefully it won't happen in future live streams and the person who called me i will be probably expressing how much i hate him from now on but we will deal with that after the live stream um did you have any other question brother or you feel like you are hungry therefore you are just like trying to find a nice ways american ways to just like hang up on me no, uh, w the reason I said that is because, you know, pretzels, they are like... Yeah, I know what they are. They. Yeah. You know, they're, yeah. Uh, you know what, what I started when I started doing my live streams, I started hearing some of the uh, arguments that Muslims present Yeah. for uh, some issues. For instance, the, uh, the word mitawafika, the, the Quran says, inni mitawafika, I made you to die and raise you up to myself. Well, if you look in the... If you look in the uh, in translations, how they translate mitawafika in the Quran into English, every place where the word wafat, mitawafika, and everything, it always means die, 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 die. But when it comes to Jesus, it means I took you, <laughs> yeah. or it means raised you, or some crazy thing. And it's like, you know, I said, you know, the Muslims are like trying to twist the Quran to fit into the, their doctrine. Because the Quran doesn't agree with their doctrine. So they twist. And so I, I started giving out awards called pretzels. I said, you get a pretzel for twisting the words to fit. And then what I did is I did a program, and, and you can watch this is on this is on YouTube. It's called the 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 Golden Pretzel Award Show. And so I gave the three top pretzels. I gave a bronze, a silver, and a golden pretzel to the sheikhs who did who who did the most best twisting job. <laughs> so anyway, that's one of the shows on my YouTube channel. It, it it only happens once a year. It's like the it's like the BAFTA or the Academy Awards. It only happens once a year, and it's it's the I golden. Should, I should take show. part in that one. <laughs> yeah, if you want to, there's a lot of controversy because people don't agree with my golden pretzel. They thought somebody else should get it, but Yasser Kadi got a bronze pretzel. For <laughs> you gave him bronze. Sorry. I I, okay. I feel your judgment skill was not very good in that. Who got the golden one? The golden one was was this one this one guy. 
who was uh, his thing was about the uh, uh, it wasn't in Imat Wafika, it's the one who says, Lemma to Wafaitani, Kuntinta Rakib Alehum. When you made me to die, you became a watcher over them. And but he was quoting the scripture in Nimit Wafik, but when he quoted it, because he's so indoctrinated, he says, Inni munimuka. He he changed the word from I I made you to die to inni munimuka. I made you to fall asleep. <laughs> he said it. It's on video. And so he got the golden golden pretzel. So, but next year I hope to have your 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 advice about maybe I'll do a, an actual poll, uh, uh, you know, an election type thing to see who wins the the golden yeah, I, pretzel. I can I can even help Muslims. Like most of times, I need to help them. I need to teach them about Islam, and then after that, I need to teach them like Islam is so awful. You need to give up. What I taught you, you need to run away from that, and then yeah. from that, you introduce Lord Jesus Christ. So that's how it is. Yeah. Um, okay, um, we already told about, um, I think we will kind of come to end from okay. my side, unless you've got any question from your side, brother. Uh, no, I didn't, you know, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I don't know if I, if I showed it on my channel, cause I, I don't know how to do this. And so, uh, but I will put it on my channel so that people can watch it. And so, uh, you know, thank you so much for having me on, having me give me a chance to talk about, you know, some of my books and some of my ministry and everything. That and uh, it was a pleasure to hear from you, and it's been great encouragement to us. Thank you so much. Um, so, how we can pray for you, brother? Uh, well, you know, I'm starting a ministry right now in a church, and I, I'm start. It's a, it's a ministry which will have a focus of outreach to Muslims, and uh, it includes going on the street preaching and having prayer night and having, you know, an actual Sunday service. And so this is how this is something that that the Lord is open for me to do. And so I just would like prayer about that ministry. This is something brand new in my life. I just started doing this, and uh, and just uh, just for wisdom on how to proceed. I'm I don't need to tell you, but you know, just with the new ministry is a new level of opposition and persecution. And so I'm I'm so tired of this. <laughs> all of the opposition and everything oh, well, and yet it doesn't matter you are tired or not as a christian we were told that it's gonna happen there will be oppositions people were opposition to eternal son of god while he was walking on the on this earth so who do you think you are you are not gonna get any opposition if you are preaching our glorious gospel opposition is going to be there essential thing is you've got to remember is we fix our eyes, the one who is on the cross. And with that, we remember Lord Jesus Christ overcome everything once for all. So just learn to work with oppositions. So that's a start thinking that as a privilege, brother. I, I seriously don't have any gift of encouragement. <laughs> but Beloved ones, those of you who's got gift of encouragement, I think at this stage, Brother Steve needs some gift of encouragement to be practiced. Please go to his YouTube channel and leave some like encouraging <laughs> comments. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise he's not getting any help from me. I apologize for that. But uh, biblical way is those things are going to happen. We remember Lord Jesus Christ overcome everything once for all. And we fix our hearts on him, our eyes on him, all of our being on him. That's all it is. But anyway, continue. So positions are going to come. And you know that Lord Jesus Christ won everything. He's overcome everything. And, and if, you could keep, if you could remember, I don't want to say the name of my village. But uh, my village has taken, uh, they've really been shaken by what I'm doing and I want them to be shaken into the kingdom of God 
shaken free from the shackles of Islam and come into the kingdom of God. So pray for them, for uh, laborers, for dreams and visions, for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Pray for my village. Just call it DD. Just call it DD. <laughs> in the Bible, it's AI. My village is AI. That's oh. in the Bible. So just pray for AI. So, <laughs> mm. and uh, that they get saved, that they come to know Jesus, and uh, that the, 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 they're agitated right now. They're all agitated. Let that agitation lead to salvation, you know? So, yeah. Okay, so we will be praying for you as you start your ministry, and also we will be praying for um, Lord to reveal himself to uh, people from your village. Um, so you've got Facebook, you've got YouTube, you has have written some books. Um, are you planning to write any more books? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, okay. I'm, uh, I'm working on one right now called Food. A Bible study and so okay. <laughs> it's about food in the Bible for some reason you know the Lord gives me these ideas and it's like Esau's you know sold his soul for pottage you know Esau sold his yeah. birthright John the Baptist had you know locusts and wild honey you know um, the, the the Jews had manna in the wilderness Israelites and, and, missed the garlic and all those things yes and Adam and Eve it, you know, food is really at the heart of almost the greatest motivation and most of the stuff that's happened in history. And uh, it's a relationship to food. And so there's Jezebel's table. There's Daniel. Who and would then not we eat got this food. at the end feast we are going to be take, being part of. Yes, the Lamb's yeah. Supper of Life. The fact that Jesus, after he came back to life, three times he ate, you Fish. know. Yeah. And it's like... So anyway, it's about it's called Food, a Bible Study. I'm not done with it yet, but if anybody has ideas for the cover, because I want something cool for the cover, then you know, we'll do a competition. I'll send you a, I'll send you a a gift coupon for Del Taco if you win. But <laughs> you can you can use the picture of the picture of Caleb. He brings the um, grapes. Huge grapes. Oh, or other great. other thing is, um, it is amazing how Lord gifted His people. Just ask people to kind of draw you cover picture, and then they can yeah. send some in, and then you just pick a couple of them. You have to pick only one, but like you can just use them. Body of Christ is so gifted uniquely. And that's something because like I did have a session on drawing Muhammad's pictures and people send it pictures they were amazing I could sell them and make money I haven't done that but I could do that you know like they will cost lots of money um yes. you could you could ask I remember me. your I remember your song contest too but anyway let's yes go on. yes you humiliated me on that topic in your live stream um and <laughs> you don't want to bring that up now <laughs> Yeah, you could you could ask uh, beloved ones, and I'm sure people will draw something and then send it, and you can just pick, or just come up your own way. Just like picture, take your picture while you are eating falafel or kebab or something. Well, yesterday I did my live stream, and I did this on purpose, but I got uh, nobody heard what I said. I was actually eating a watermelon while doing my live stream yesterday. And so I did it for effect. I think people are going to watch because of the watermelon. <laughs> and so I did. I got tons of people who watch just because of the watermelon. So, but, you know, maybe a way to get them to listen. So, <laughs> Not sure. Not sure if that is good advertisement. Um, beloved brother, um, Thank you very much for being available for me. Thank you very much for making time, not only telling us what Lord has been doing with you and through you, but also uh, sharing the stories how Lord is actively working, uh, actively working in the life of individuals. It is great encouragement to us. Uh, Thank you very much for helping us to fall in love once again with our crucified and risen Lord. So I really, really appreciate your time. 
and uh, even though you are so much hyper it has been what? identified that has been identified as full of joy in the lord uh, i'm not gonna label that but there is something <laughs> there is something not good on that. <laughs> so uh anyway on serious note um really really appreciate your time and all your contribution and encouragement you brought to us tonight so much. and uh yeah. dear beloved ones thank you very much for joining us on another live stream and uh, i did put um on the screen a little bit earlier uh, Brother Sam Shamoon is live or going live. Um, do check that out. Do subscribe to Brother Stephen's channel as well as remember to give thanks. Um, the message which was put together by Rob Christian regarding the individuals who left Islam and become lover of Lord Jesus Christ. Give thanks for that. And dear Muslims, Day after day, you will get to hear that people are running away from Islam because Islam is false ideology, Muhammad is false prophet, Allah is false God, and Quran is false book. As you run, we do pray that you come into run into the arms of Lord Jesus Christ and you feel his heartbeat for you and you receive the new heart he is giving to you. With, uh, on that note, we will see you tomorrow evening for another live stream. Brother, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much for having me.